joyous sounds of a YY Shotoweka festival humanize the wild forest noises of the Amazon. As a harpy eagle soars over the world's largest remaining rainforest, people from the tropical lowlands to the Andean highlands initiate their young, mourn their dead, organize pilgrimages, and celebrate the endless cycle of cultural renewal. For over 100 years, anthropologists have visited South America to study the continuity of change across the ages. To learn about some of the people of South America, select a topic and touch a button. Expedition. The University Museum launched its first expedition to the Amazon rainforest in 1913. The field trip was conducted over a three-year period and headed by Dr. William Curtis Farabee, curator of the American section of the University Museum. In a 1913 journal publication, the museum announced the goals of its expedition. The language of the statement reflects anthropological thinking of the time to reach the tribes that still remain in their primitive condition in the forests of the Amazon and collect weapons, utensils, ornaments, and all objects relating to the arts of life, which will be found among the various tribes visited. They are destined to supply material for future research and especially to enable the museum to reproduce for the public benefit the actual life of some of the most picturesque peoples now inhabiting the earth, but soon to disappear. The Amazon Expedition. In November 1913, on a ranch in Dara Dr. Faraby visited H.P.C. Melville, Esquire, magistrate and protector of Indians for the whole southern Guiana region. Here William Faraby met John Ogilvy, a Scottish settler familiar with the region and its people. Ogilvy spoke fluent Wapashiana, a native language he had learned while working with the Indians. Farabee persuaded Ogilvy to escort the expedition on its journey to the interior. From Dadanawa, the expedition began a four-and-a-half-month field trip, making visits with the Taruma, Waiwai, Farakato, Mapidian, Chikina, Diao, and others. William Farabee kept a journal during the expedition and published several articles and monographs about his visits. The following presentation is based on excerpts from his work. On November 19, 1913, we left Melville's ranch with a pack train numbering 62 men, women, and children to carry across the savanna five days to a point on the Kudwini River. Many whole families went with us to the river. As there was no one left behind to care for them, the small children, young dogs, chickens, and other pets had to be carried along. On the way, we passed through their traditional home where every mountain was sacred we sacrificed tufts of grass at many shrines and stepped high over the trails of evil spirits. At the landing place, we spent a day arranging our canoes and saying goodbye to each one of our numerous friends. After 12 days of traveling down the Kudwini River, the expedition reached the Essequibo River. Traveling up the Essequibo toward Waiwai country, Farabee and his crew visited two Taruma villages. December 11th. Arrived at first Taruma village at eight hours. Tohi is headman. Spent the day about the village getting acquainted and trading and getting observations, morning, afternoon, and night. December 12th. Spent day trading, taking photographs. December 13th, got a lot of potatoes, bread, cashews, pineapples, and bananas. Left at eight hours for upriver. At the second Tarama village, we fell in with Kiwini, the Waiwai chief from Wakakulud on Blood Creek, an eastern branch of the Essequibo, some three or four days upriver. 
The chief was making a new field and had come down to the Teramas to get cassava cuttings to plant. One of his three wives was the daughter of the Terama chief, and hence the two tribes were very friendly. We told Kiwinik of our plan to visit his people in the villages east of the Akarai Mountains and asked him to go with us and furnish some men. He was quite willing to go, but his field was cleared and the cuttings were ready and must be planted at once or they would spoil. We offered to help with the planting, as there were already 15 Indians in our party and five Taramas would join him if he would go. He immediately agreed to the plan. They loaded the cassava cuttings in two Tarama canoes. The chief and his youngest wife took passage with us in our large canoe, and we set out. After assisting Kuwinik with his planning, the expedition journeyed on to Malatili, the second Waiwai village, and arrived on December 24th. The expedition spent several days at the site, and Farabee made some entries in his journal. December 25th, got up at daylight as usual and had chocolate. Went to the village and traded, took some photographs. They repeated a part of the dance they performed last night, and I got some good photographs. Then took physical measurements of men, boys, and women. So we had a good and busy Christmas day. December 26th, men went hunting. Came in at night with two pigs, a deer, several turkeys got some photos, took some observations. December 27th, worked about the village. Our information is so unreliable, we decided to send two YYs to the Mapidian country to bring them to see us so we can find out how far it actually is. The expedition left the YY village on January 9th and traveled eastward down the Mapuera River to visit Mapidian and Farakato villages. From there, the journey continued across land and through the rapids to visit other Indian groups. This leg of the expedition came to an end when Faraby, running low on quinine and other supplies, determined to take the shortest route out of the forest. The Mato Grosso Expedition. In 1931, the University Museum, together with the Academy of Natural Sciences and the Explorers Club, sponsored an expedition to a region located between the Xingu and Araguaia rivers in the Mato Grosso of Brazil. The museum sent Dr. Vincent Petrullo as representative and scientific advisor. The purpose of the expedition was to create a popular and scientific record of life in the territory. The expedition was very high-tech for its day. An amphibian plane was used to make an air survey of the region and a trip up the Xingu. One of the objectives was to produce a series of educational films with sound recorded in the field so students could hear as well as see the native people of South America. Synchronous field sound recording was at the time a very experimental technology and the project generated much excitement. In addition to cultural collections and animal specimens brought back to the museum and the Academy of Natural Sciences, many hours of moving images were edited into two motion pictures about the expedition. One was intended for theatrical release, the other was produced by the museum for museum purposes. The theatrical film begins in New York Harbor and concludes on the deck of the ocean liner on the voyage back home. The film equally divides its attention among the exploits of Explorer Club members, peoples of the region, and the exotic and sometimes dangerous animals of the Mato Grosso. Like the theatrical film, the museum's film is steeped in the movie conventions of the day. It uses dramatic music and the voice of a popular and respected radio and film narrator to tell the story of its expedition to the Mato Grosso and its visit with the Barolo. Grosso, located in the center of the South American continent, 
a last refuge of primitive tribes. Unlike the theatrical film, the museum's presentation does not find danger lurking in every aspect of life in the Mato Grosso. Instead, it presents the Bororo as a people living in harmony with the environment. The museum's film focuses on daily living activities and the performance of some rituals. The film presentation, however, is always consistent with movie storytelling devices of the day, making use of dramatic orchestral arrangements and voiceover narration. The Bororo are essentially a river people and depend on fish for food to a great extent. Fish are caught in traps occasionally, but the favorite method is to shoot the fish with bow and arrow. The Bororo canoe is a dugout, long and narrow. It is propelled by means of a long, heavy paddle. In this trade scene, set up for the benefit of the camera, traders stage the business of doing business. The objects mentioned in the film's narration represent some of the objects collected for the museum. Today, they are anxious to obtain iron knives, axes, cloth, and other goods. The expedition was well supplied with such things for trade with the Bororo, who offered their bows, arrows, pots, baskets, and ornaments of all sorts. They enjoyed the improvised fair very much, it seemed. Sound equipment was not yet portable. Nevertheless, the expedition made an attempt to use lip-synchronous sound recording equipment. According to Petrullo, the system was troublesome, and the only piece of synchronous sound to appear in the museum's film is this Bororo explaining the process of making a bow and arrow. Inspired by the Mato Grosso expedition, Petrullo recognized the potential of film and audio recordings in ethnographic fieldwork. After his return to Philadelphia, he worked to establish a Latin American research institute. As part of the plan, he proposed establishing a foundation for an ethnological motion picture survey of the peoples of South America. Unfortunately, funds were not forthcoming, and neither the institute nor the foundation were ever realized. The William Pepper Peruvian Expedition. In 1895, Dr. William Pepper sponsored an archaeological expedition to Peru. Max Ule, a German archaeologist, excavated and made collections at Pachacamac and other coastal sites. At the turn of the century, most archaeological expeditions were undertaken to retrieve ancient valuables. Artifacts of gold and silver, beautifully decorated ceramics, and exquisite textiles were enthusiastically collected and displayed in museums. In Peru, Ule did do some collecting at Pachacamac for the University Museum, but more importantly, he had scientific intentions. He sought to discover the role of Pachacamac in the development of Andean culture. Ule methodically set about his task of discovery and revelation. Attempting to understand life at the ancient ceremonial center, Ule went beyond the archaeological methods common at that time. He drew a detailed map of the site of Pachacamac, pinpointing large and small structures, seeking to grasp how pre-Columbian people lived their lives. With great excitement, he proclaimed, all our prehistory of Peru has until now been idle talk. It is not sufficient to make some indifferent plans of one or two of the chief buildings. The whole settlement must be put into the plan in its entirety. How is it possible to understand the life of the ancients by merely picking out two of the chief buildings of a big town which contained so many big buildings? Based on remains found while excavating in one small section of a Pachacamac cemetery measuring 2,800 square meters in its entirety, 
Ule estimated the cemetery contained some 6,000 mummy burials. He reported that the mummies had been buried in a number of different ways. Some alone, others huddled together, some in coarse cotton rags, others more elaborately with false heads and sometimes feather ornaments. Ula realized that careful attention to the materials found in graves could yield more rewarding information about a culture than excavating in any other area. Because of the custom of burying unremarkable items, such as utilitarian objects, vessels, food, and animal remains, along with the deceased, burials could provide information about daily living that was not available by any other means. Ule's earlier archaeological work relied on the use of museum collections of South American artifacts. His field experience seems to have inspired him to a whole new understanding of the dynamics of archaeological research. I cannot describe to you the degree to which personal observation of the regions in which the pre-Columbian cultural history of America was enacted increases one's interest in research subjects, changes one's general point of view, stimulates the development of research methods, and improves the results of one's researches. Armed with new insights and guided by knowledge gleaned from museum collections and some prior field work in the Andean highlands, Ula brought his total experience to bear in deciphering the archaeological clues he was beginning to assemble. After excavating at the foot of the mound within the town, I worked my way up to the big terraced temple on the highest point of the mound, from which a delicious panorama over the sea, the Pachacamac Islands, the luxuriant valley of Lurin, the sandy desert to the north, and a considerable part of the Cordilleras is obtained. Nothing is more surprising than the fundamental contrast of finds on the big terraced temple to those from within the town at the foot of the mound. At the coastal site of Pachacamac, in addition to the distinctive coastal style he expected to find there, Ule found objects like those from collections made at Tiwanaku and more recent Inca highland sites. From the material found, Ule deduced that at different times in its development, Pachacamac was influenced by people from the mountains. Furthermore, he understood that the style of artifacts could be used to learn the time period in which they were made. Based on this insight, Ule proposed a chronological sequence for the development of Peruvian cultures. The basis of the sequence is still in use today. Changing world. Information. American and European social and natural scientists have long traveled to South America to study its native peoples. Now South American Indians are visiting North America, Europe, and other parts of the world to teach about the rainforests and to stop the destruction of the environment and of the native peoples who have lived there for thousands of years. Their efforts are having world impact. In 1989, the United Nations awarded Davi Kapanawa Yanomami, a Yanomamo Indian from northern Brazil, the prestigious Global 500 Environmental Award in recognition of his campaigns to preserve the land of his people. The attention of the world press has focused on the plight of South American Indians and their struggle to defend their homelands from senseless destruction. Numerous projects threaten the very existence of Amazonian people. Barrero, Waiwai, and Kashinawa have all felt the devastating impacts of highway development gold prospecting, rubber tapping, cattle ranching, and the construction of dams. The Cayapo Indians from the Xingu River of central Brazil have been the most vocal among Amazonian peoples in their fight to stop the destruction of millions of acres of Amazon forest lands. The native peoples of South America are making their presence felt around the world by actively contributing to and expanding our knowledge of the planet we all inhabit. South American Indians are introducing Western scientists to indigenous plant genetics 
and a wide variety of medicinal plants and herbs. They have been collaborating with ethnobiologists and other natural scientists in researching the use of native reforestation methods, natural pesticides, and fertilizer alternatives. Many native peoples practice a sophisticated form of agriculture in which patches of the forest are temporarily cleared, planted, and harvested. After about three years, these plots are given back to the forest. <laughs> The following information appeared in the publication, Report on the Americas. In February 1988, Kayako Chief Paulinho Payakan visited the World Bank in Washington, D.C. to mobilize public opinion against the bank's participation in a $10.6 billion dam project. If built, the dam would flood over 15 million acres of rich land on the Shingu River, displacing 11 Indian groups. When Payakan returned to his native Brazil, he was arrested. Paulinho Payakan, together with another Kayapo chief and an American ethnobiologist, Darrell Posey, were charged under the law of foreigners with interfering with Brazil's energy plans. In the city of Belém, Brazil, the charges were fought in the court and protested on the streets. Eventually, charges against the Kayapo were dropped after the incident received international press attention. The World Bank withdrew its support for the dam project, and the Lower Shingu was saved from destruction. Recounting the Berlin event, Posey reported that Kayakan said, Kayapo used to defend themselves with war clubs and spears, but today we defend ourselves with words, our heads, and the press. Native South American Indians are encouraging international discussions about the Amazon by engaging the interest of the world press. As part of their media awareness, some are learning to produce their own media. <laughs> On April 23, 1991, Davi Yanomami, a Yanomami Indian, was interviewed on National Public Radio. The following is an excerpt from that interview. Davi Kopanawa Yanomami is a Yanomami Indian of the Amazon rainforest in Brazil. He is the first Yanomami ever to visit the United States, and he hopes this trip will help save his people from extinction. Since 1987, a gold rush has brought more than 40,000 prospectors onto Yanomami land. The gold miners have built clandestine airstrips, polluted rivers and streams, and introduced to the tribe's people diseases they had never experienced. This has caused the Yanomami population to fall from 9,000 in 1987 to just 7,500 today. How were you chosen to be the one to come to the United States and tell us of this problem. Eu recebia com Covid quando eu estava na minha aldeia. I received an invitation with, when I was in my village because people da, are da, uh, abroad are seeing how my Yanomami people are suffering and they realize that então, the Yanomami people have to come to the cities and have to spread the news and this is all helping the Indians. For, yeah, so I'm for, here speaking up for my people, looking for help to save my people. The World Bank has promised to help this emergency health program that's been set up for the Yanomami area. But I want them really to help my people, for my people to be healthy, for the doctors to carry on working, and above all, to diminish the death rate. If the World Bank doesn't help, uh, it means that the death rate will continue. Um, a lot of people, of my people, are dying from malaria, so they must give us this help. It's very, very important. Given the history of uh, U.S. treatment of American Indian problems, uh, what would give you confidence that the United States would be helpful to Indian populations in Brazil? <laughs> I don't, don't have much faith in governments, but people here, I know people here, want to help the Indian people. They want to help us defend our lands. They don't want to see Indians being ill-treated like they have been in the past. Um, a lot of people here want to see Indian peoples have their lands demarcated and to be able to live in the future with their culture and their traditions intact. What do you think will happen to your people? 
Eu acho que... Eu, eu tô achando... Nós... Nós achamos... I think that we, and especially our shamans, we actually know our future. We know what is going to happen to us. And what is going to happen to us is going to happen to everybody in this world. In the future, Omam, who is the creator, is going to look for retribution for all the Yanomami who have died. And the whole world will end. Video. A Kayapo video project has been established in which Kayapo people make their own video messages. They are using video as a tool for organizing to save their lands and as an instrument for cultural survival. This videotape was made by the Kayapo expressly for use in this exhibit. When anthropologist Terence Turner discussed the museum's project with them, the Kayapo agreed to make this tape. They also had another suggestion. They thought it might be a good idea if museums would not only obtain the Kayapo headdresses, but also acquire a videotape made by the Kayapo which would show the making of the headdress. When visitors came to see the headdress, they could press a button to see how it was made. If you would like to see and hear this piece again without voiceover, touch the camera icon. If you would like to see the piece again and hear Professor Turner describe the dance, touch the feather icon. The feather work of the Kayapo people of central Brazil is made to be worn on occasions of public ceremony. It is meant to be displayed in motion and in mass, forming an integral part of the movements of the dancers as they move in unison in mass formations. The Kayapo call dancing flying, and the word for feather headdress is based on the word for bird. The feathers decorating the arms, heads, necks, and backs of these women as they dance symbolically transform them into sacred birds for their collective ritual flight. Displaying the feather ornaments each individual has inherited from his or her kin is not merely an accompaniment or decorative accessory to ritual activity. It often becomes the point of the ceremony, as in the final rite of the corn ceremony, the Barijumoko, when each group of related men proudly displays the unique headdresses and other ornaments they have inherited from their grandfathers. In the climactic moment of this rite, all the feathered celebrants stand together in front of the men's house in a collective display of their feathered finery. The dancers of, of the Takuk ceremony wear the characteristic Kayapo bird headdress. Even the jaguars impersonated by some of the dancers in this ceremony are covered with feathers, and some wear the unique Kayapo feather headdress, the akapari. The young people being honored in the ritual stoically endure the assaults of the jaguars, their arms adorned with feathered wings for their ritual flight. <laughs> 